Hello and welcome to another episode of Free Mississippi. Today I've got an amazing guest, Zuby. Zuby, thank you so much for coming and doing this. Oh good Douglas, how you doing? Now for those of you watching who don't know, Zuby is, you're, you're a rapper, you're also um, an Oxford graduate, you, um, you're, I, I think I could say you're, you're sort of maybe made in England, but you've been raised in Saudi Arabia, and you've got a very sort of um, international outlook on, on the world. Mm -hmm. And from my point of view, the most exciting thing is you've just arrived in America. Um, how are you finding it? Yeah, it's fantastic. I, so far, I've been to Houston, Orlando, Miami, and I'm currently in Austin right now. Uh, so I've been in the free states. I've been in red states so far. I will be heading up towards the East Coast later on and then out to Hawaii and the West Coast. So things might be a little bit different over there from what I've heard. But in Texas and Florida, life is normal. Stuff is just normal. I, like you, I'm a recent arrival in America and I've been living in a, a what you might call a free state, Mississippi. Um, mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, isn't it? How different it is being in America, how exhilarating it is almost after, after being in, in, in the UK and Europe. Um, tell us a little bit about your impressions of America. Sure thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the USA. Um, I always have been. I actually went to an American school in Saudi Arabia when I was a kid. I was in the American school system from preschool up until fifth grade, so up until the age of 11. So my background and perspective has always been a combination of different places, being born in the UK, raised in Saudi Arabia, went to an American school, family background from originally from Nigeria. And I think the USA is its certainly one of my favorite countries in the world for a lot of different reasons. And one of those underlying reasons is the freedom and liberty aspect. I think the USA is probably the only country in the world which was initially really based off of an idea, based off fundamental principles, a constitution, bill of rights, which obviously took many years for those rights and the ideas to be fulfilled and to actually apply to all members of the population. But I think the US is a fantastic country. I love the geography and the expanse of it from a business and creative perspective. It's full of opportunity and everything is on such a bigger scale. The people I've met have been very, very kind and warm and welcoming to me and really appreciative. And overall, for what I do personally as a, as a rapper, public speaker, author, podcaster, um, it makes more sense for me to be here than to be in the UK and perhaps many other countries. I, I completely, I, I find it exhilarating being here. I, I almost feel as if I've been supposed to be here all of my life. I've been in America, <laughs> all my life. I just didn't realize it till I got here. I mean, mm. it's, it's exhilarating in all sorts of ways. I mean, I, I find quite trivial ways, like, I don't know, for example, you know, the, the salad here is so much better than the salad in London because I guess, <laughs> It's, it's, it was in a field a few days ago, whereas in London, it's probably been imported from halfway across the planet. But, you know, even little things like, you know, at my kids' school, they talk about whether or not to have a masks. And mm -hmm. the head teacher never talks about what the prime minister thinks or what the government wants. They talk about what, what they think um, mm. we should do. And there's, there's this kind of sense of ownership. You, you've got ownership of your life, of yourself, of your state. Yep. And frankly, you know, Washington is what you you hear people talking about on Fox News. It doesn't really interfere with the day to day. I, I find it quite, quite, quite exhilarating. It's it's a it's it's a it's wonderful place to be. It really is. Yeah. Well, I think one one key difference with the USA is that it is the United States of America. So it's really a conglomeration of 50 different almost little countries on their own. So you can be there in Mississippi, I can be in Texas and Actually, our experience is very different to someone who's living out in uh, New York or California or, um, you know, any uh, Oregon. So it's really interesting. I think even from in terms of the geography with the fact that whatever climate you're after, there's a place for you, whatever kind of, you know, geography you like. So, you know, your political leanings, the type of laws and policies you prefer or don't prefer, you know, if you want to be somewhere where everyone's wearing masks and whatever, you, you actually have that option. Right? It's, it's not my You're option. You're to move to Boston. Or exactly. You know, so I think that's, I actually think that's really cool. I think it's cool that that's all available within the same country. Does that lead to 
does that level of diversity lead to uh, some potential conflicts and issues that you may not have to deal with somewhere like the UK? Absolutely. But I think that I'm someone who very much believes in individual liberty and individual choice and personal responsibility and all of that. And I don't think any country embodies that better, at least in principle, than the USA does. There's less of a collectivist mentality. And I actually think that what is best for the collective is actually applying those principles of individual liberty and freedom and rights and options, et cetera. I think that's actually what is people talk a lot about, you know, the greater good these days and, you know, what is best for the public and, you know, general people and use that as a means to control other people and tell them what to do in many instances. But I think actually, if you make the individual um, of utmost importance, shall we say, and give them autonomy and freedom and liberty, then people will make the, you know, of course, people get worried, oh, well, you know, people might make the wrong choices, or they might make bad choices. And it's like, look, that's, that's part of a free society. If you want to control every aspect, then you're just going to have straight up authoritarianism. Um, one thing that really struck me when I arrived here um, at the beginning of this year is the, what I think is the excessive pessimism of the conservative movement in America. They seem to be mm -hmm. deeply despondent, Losing the election seems to have affected them out of all proportion to the result. I contrast that with the conservative movement on the other side of the Atlantic. I think British conservatives are more optimistic than they ought to be. American conservatives are more pessimistic than they ought to be. And I, I, I think it perhaps takes an outsider like you to explain to American conservatives who believe in individual liberty how, how wonderful their country still is. And and, you know, whereas British conservatives, just because they've won elections, seem to think that, you know, they're, they're doing the right thing. American mm. conservatives seem to have lost heart. Have you found that? Honestly, I haven't. Maybe my view has been skewed because when I got here, when I was in Houston, I spoke at the Young America's Foundation annual student conference. And then I also spoke at the Young Americans for Liberty conference in Orlando, Florida. Uh -huh. So that was hundreds of hundreds of people who were, you know, primarily conservative and or libertarian leaning. And the optimism was very, very high. The maybe positivity was, was maybe it was listening to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not sure what it's like on, on a wider scale. I think I think what what you're saying is is true to a degree. I think that people in general are feeling a bit despondent and lacking optimism. I think that the human spirit has largely been, you know, intentionally crushed over the past 18 months, not just in the USA or in the UK. I think globally, a lot of people are just feeling for, for all sorts of reasons, right? And some of them actually opposite. But I think a lot of people are just feeling somewhat demoralized. I think it's been quite a demoralizing past 18 months. And I think that now that the main threat in terms of you know the the virus that came out and which was scaring people back in you know February March April last year i think that people are still stuck in this sort of panic mode and in this cycle of negative emotion on all sides and i think people actually need to should be, i think people should be in celebration mode right now that's one of the things that's actually kind of disappointing me with some places i mean it's it's great it's probably great where you are in mississippi it's it's cool here in texas but i'm seeing in other parts of the world people are still stuck in this negative cycle. Whereas actually it's like, hey, like the, the main threat has actually been dealt with, right? Sounds this is- vaccine. I mean, it's, isn't it extraordinary? Yeah. 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 So pe people should be out celebrating and not like, oh, okay, we need to put on three masks now and we need to keep staying home and we need to keep doing, you know, you see one case comes in Australia or New Zealand, they shut the whole country. I mean, that's no way to live. And there's no- there's no way out of that if you think about it. This is the thing when people are sort of praising this approach, I'm kind of like, well, are they gonna just keep doing this for eternity? Cause you're always gonna get new cases, this, yeah. Tell, tell me, how do you explain the, what to me seems utterly mad decision-making, particularly by political leaders in, in the Antipodes, Australia and New Zealand, but you know, are they just stupid, some of the people in public office, or do you think there's a malevolent agenda? Do you think, do you think when um, um, Jacinda Ahern issues a lockdown, do you think she, she, she's searching for purpose as a politician, or do you think she genuinely believes that it's 
a proportionate response to the crisis. How, how, do, how do we explain this extraordinary sort of neurosis of the Western leadership at the moment? Yeah, it's complicated. I mean, the way I am, I always try to err on the side of most people mean well. Um, with that said, I know that there are some people who don't like, I, I don't know the New Zealand prime minister on any personal level. So I, I don't know, but I also am aware that perverse incentives exist. And one perverse incentive that people in any government or any position of power are always going to be prone to is this desire to exercise control and authority. That is really what governments are for, right? If you are a prime minister, a mayor, a governor, a president, you are in a position of power. And as we all know, you can give someone even the, the smallest amount of power, you can make them a hall monitor, you can make them someone who hands out traffic tickets, you can make them the person who checks the tickets on the train, where are certain people who when they get that power and authority over others, they find it addicting, and they find purpose and meaning in it. And it can be difficult for them to relinquish that even when it's over, you're seeing in some of these places, they want to keep the, these emergency powers forever, because a lot of governors, mayors, et cetera, they're actually quite enjoying being able to just tell people what to do and control the population and act it like they're the good guy. It puts them center stage. It makes them feel big and important. Um, it does. Like, it does. The, the political leader who says, do you know what? You you assess the risk yourself. You know, they 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 don't appear as important. I, mm. I wonder. Yeah. I think also people are afraid of looking weak, perhaps. So I think that nation to nation, other countries are watching what other leaders are doing. And they're almost now in this competition of who can be who can be the most authoritarian, who can be the most strict and exert the most power and show them, look, we're, we, we've got this power that we can just do this and the population just goes with it. But in my mind, a stronger leader who actually abides by principles of liberty and freedom would understand that individuals still have agency. I'm not going to just run roughshod over the rights and liberties of my entire population in order to make a point. I'm going to balance it out. And I think that that's really been lacking. I think a handful of countries have done it. Some states here in the USA have done it. Um, but outside of that, I think the majority of places around the world went very much with that former approach. And I, again, I think they're stuck in this loop and they don't really want to just let go. And Zubi, one of the things I've been really struck by many of your tweets over, over, over the years is some of your extraordinarily powerful observations about the, the state of the West. You're a, mm -hmm. you're a well-known um, uh, bodybuilder. You, 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 you uh, take great interest in making sure that um, you're, you're physically in good shape. You've made some really important observations, I think, about the, the fitness of Western culture. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this. I mean, I, my feeling is that the West is in a terrible state at the moment, in a, in a real mess. And it's not the images coming out of Afghanistan that are, 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 are the problem. It's not, um, you know, failures of Western foreign policy that's the problem. It's it's a much more fundamental, deep-rooted, internal failing of the West. Um, there's a, a, a reluctance to believe in objective facts. There's a, an obsession with cultural and moral relativism. And despite the fact that the West is founded on the idea of individualism, I, I think across many parts of Europe and, and the English speaking world, the idea of individualism is, is under attack. Could you share your thoughts about this? I mean, you, you, you were raised in a country that, if I can put it bluntly, didn't really have much truck for any kind of relativism. It believed in absolutism. What are, you, what are your thoughts on, on the state of the West and, and how do you think we, we, we try and fix some of these problems? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting because I hear what you're saying totally. And I think we're in this weird place where on one hand, stuff is really great and there's so much to be optimistic about, but then you sort of look at it from another angle and it looks like society and culture is very sick and is on the decline in some other ways. And it's, it's kind of weird how both of those things seem to be true depending on how you look at it. I have days where I'm just like, you know, wow, okay, like this, this is great. And from, from a global and a historical perspective, I think it's, it's, there's no doubt that we are living in incredibly, despite all the past 
18 months, you know, we're still living in incredibly prosperous times and people have more uh, equality than ever before. And there's all these opportunities and we have wonderful technology. People are living longer than ever before, et cetera. Um, but then at the same time, I think on a more, I, I think it's interesting you, you, you brought up fitness. I think on a sort of mental and moral and physical fitness level, I think modern Western society is quite, quite sick. And I think that perhaps people have forgotten, number one, just, just how good we have it. They've lost that sense of perspective and gratitude. And I think that things have been so comfortable for so long that people have forgotten the struggle. As we know, if you don't work out your body, you, you, you get flabby and you get weak. If you don't work out your mind, it, uh, it degrades. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is sort of happening both metaphorically and literally amongst a, a, lot of, a lot of people, across millions of people. Life has been so easy for so long that minor threats get massively uh, exaggerated and people respond in a way that is not proportionate. Uh, you, you, we saw this prior to any pandemic with things like uh, trigger warnings and safe spaces and everyone, you know, speech is violence and, oh my gosh, I heard an idea I don't like and I'm, I now need to hide in a bunker with some, with some crayons and coloring pencils. I mean, that's not, that's not healthy. We've seen all of the strange stuff that's going on with um, various issues across racial lines or gender lines or sexuality. People are inventing new genders and if you don't abide by it you're a bigot and you're hateful and you know these are my pronouns if you don't respect my pronouns this is an existential threat not all of this is only possible in a society of if you go to a country where people are still genuinely struggling then of course you know there's only two genders still it's like the more prosperous a society becomes and the more comfortable people become the more they can entertain certain ideas so you attribute some of this angst to what you might call almost sort of boredom. We're so indulged, we, 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 there's a sort of a cultural boredom. Do you think yeah. another way of explaining it might be digital technology? Digital allows us to choose whatever music we want, whatever films we want. It gives us the idea that you know, self-selection becomes a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. And people then apply that to things that you and I know you, you can't select, um, like your gender or your, 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 your pronouns. And perhaps what we're seeing is an attempt by people who are so used to the idea of self-selection to almost self-select characteristics that, that they're born with. And, and, and this is uh -huh. the root cause of the problem. It's an interesting perspective. I don't think it's the root cause. I think it's an accelerator and an amplifier. I think the root cause is a lot deeper and goes back many more decades prior to smartphones and social media. But I think with the advent of smartphones and social media, people have the ability to communicate ideas and bring them on board much faster. You have the uh, option to, something that happens on social media, and I'm sure you've seen this, Douglas, is a very small number of people can make it look like they're far more numerous than they are, right? I'm sure you get this thing where in the real world, most people are actually quite sane and reasonable and kind and empathetic and you know, they're, they're not in this crazy land. And then you go on, you go online, you go on Twitter and all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, is every, has everybody lost their mind? Like what's going on? Like I, I, I'm not, in, I'm seeing perspectives and views and things being voiced that I've never really heard in, in the real world. I, I go on Twitter and suddenly it's, it's, it's crazy. And I think this happens. I think it also happened previously on college campuses, et cetera, where a very small minority who's very vocal uh, can make themselves seem like they are the majority, whereas in fact, they're not the majority. And I think that, again, because there's this cultural malaise um, and a level of cowardice as well, where people don't want to stand up for certain to certain things, um, it's very easy for a small minority of people with, you know, quite radical ideas to cow the majority. So even if the majority doesn't believe in it, they sort of end up going along with it and getting caught up with it particularly if that tiny minority is able to wrap their rather idiotic ideas in the cloak of intellectual and cultural sophistication. I, I've spoken on a number of campuses where there's an almost a, a, a sort of um, an attempt by a tiny number of the most outspoken Wokies to, to appear wiser than they are. And you, 
you, you, you know, I, I think that's part of the problem. Ordinary people um, assume, perhaps wrongly, that mm. um, the people who bang on about intersectionalism know something that they don't know, which in fact isn't isn't the case. Now, you, yeah. you said digital was the accelerator, but the real cause of this cultural flabbiness, this cultural malaise, goes back mm. decades earlier. What 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 do you think the root cause is? So I think I think it's a number of things. So as I said before. I think it's been a long time since we've had any real threats to our existence. I mean, if you would just look back in history or you look at other parts of the world, there's a real fight for survival. There's a battle against nature, a battle against disease, which, uh, you know, we've seen how we respond to that. And I, I think we've over severely overreacted, given the actual facts and statistics around this particular one. Um, you know, we haven't been fighting wars not so long ago, decades ago, you know, People like myself, you know, I would have been having friends dying in war and dying in battle. Maybe I myself would have even been drafted into the military to go fight overseas or something like that. And my generation, and I think the one above it and the one below it, haven't, thank God, had to, had to deal with this. Um, we haven't had massive poverty. I mean, if you just go back 100 years ago, poverty was the norm. It was the default, even in, even in the West right? People were poor. People were just struggling to survive. And when people are struggling to survive, they don't have time to entertain yeah. a lot of nonsense, right? They don't have the, uh, the capacity and will to deal with all of this stuff. So I think that's a factor. I also think a lot of these ideas, you mentioned um, intersectionality, or if people want to talk about gender theory, critical race theory, queer theory, all of these things are academic disciplines, which really arose primarily throughout the 60s and the 70s. Now, they were always very fringe, postmodernism as well. These were very fringe ideas, but somehow they've been mainstreamed over the past decade or so. So a lot of these ideas, which people are now seeing and talking about, they're not, they're not new. They're not brand new. They've been around for decades. But what is new is institutions and individuals and even companies and organizations taking them very, very seriously and applying them as if they are factually and objectively correct. So I think that's a big part of it. I, and I think, like I said, the internet has accelerated that happening. I mean, if you go back five, five years ago, nobody had their pronouns in their Twitter bio. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. Go back five years ago, if somebody told you that I could become the British women's deadlift record holder, they would have said, no, like that's not possible. That's insane. But things have accelerated so quickly and people have indulged these ideas that it's now possible. I think another factor is also the sort of chill that's arisen with this sort of rising tide of censorship and safetyism and deplatforming and words of violence and you know questions about free speech. People used to fight for free speech and fight fight for freedom and fight for liberty, and now some people fight to have those things taken away because they're afraid of being offended or hearing something they don't like, etc. And really, really, what it is, it's um, it's all very immature actually. It, it's become it's like people have become more childish over time. Even the, even the way people debate and argue and discuss, it's very, very childish. Sometimes I'll, I'll be on Twitter or even in the real world, and I feel like I'm conversing with, with a child. Everything is false dichotomies, false binaries. Either it's pro or anti. There's very little nuance, just trying to call names, et cetera. It's sort of intellectual and cultural infantilization. Yeah. yeah. Great way to put it. Great way to put it. Um, you talked about critical race theory and some of these ideas. How do we how do we respond? How, as free market conservatives, should we should we tackle these these things? What what do we need to do? I think with honesty and with courage. I think something that's truly truly lacking is courage. Um, and and again, I think this speaks to where we are as a society. Every day, I get people like, "Man, Zuby, you're so brave. You're so courageous. I admire your courage." I don't think I'm all that courageous. Like to me, courage is putting your life on the line. I'm like, hey man, I'm just saying things. <laughs> I'm talking on podcasts, I'm tweeting, I'm making songs. I'm not out there, you know, getting shot at or running into burning buildings or diving into water to save people or whatever. I'm not putting my life at risk. I'm just talking and saying what I think is correct and sharing my opinions, sharing certain facts, et cetera. We live in a time where people are afraid to actually share facts. People are afraid to say things that are even objectively true, let alone opinions. And I think that everybody, uh, sane conservatives, sane liberals, sane centrists, people who are apolitical, just need to be a bit more bold and courageous individually and thus collectively. 
if everyone is just like, okay, you know what, that is, we, we can all have discussions around different opinions, mm -hmm. but something dangerous that's happening now is we're, we're operating off what seems to be different sets of facts and entire different realities. So it's like, okay, let's pin down the facts. And then once we've pinned down the facts and we can be objective, lots of room to have discussion and debate. And people shouldn't be afraid of discussion and debate. Um, I understand that perhaps I'm less conflict averse than, men, than the average person, but I also myself don't particularly seek conflict. I seek the truth. And every, I think everybody should be, should be doing that. And to do that, you have to have conversations. You have to have discussions. You have to ask questions, challenge people, uh, so on and so forth. So I think that's really what's needed is just, a, I, don't know, I don't know exactly how to make people more courageous. Perhaps it helps for them to think. Something I have noticed is people think very short term. So a lot of people are afraid to speak up or say anything because they're worried about short term con consequences. I have a job. I have kids. I don't want to get canceled. I don't want to, you know, they're, they're worried about short term things, but they have to understand that if they don't speak up, if they don't speak up, things are going to, all the stuff they're worried about is going to proceed to get worse. It's all going to get worse. And any aspect of this that you're concerned about, if you're worried about critical race theory, if you do not speak up about it, the people who are pushing it, they're not going to stop. They're going to, they're going to keep going, right? They're going to, they're going to be telling if, if your, if your child is a, is a white, they're going to be telling them that they're, they're privileged and that they should have white guilt and this and that. And if their child is black or is brown, that they're oppressed and they're a victim and white people perhaps are even their enemy, so on and so forth. It's very divisive. And what it's going to lead to is not pleasant or positive. Yeah. Right. And so I think perhaps it helps, especially people who have children, especially people who have children to think, okay, what kind of world and society do I want my children to inherit? Do I want them to have less freedom and less liberty than I do? Do I want them to be judged off of their skin color? No, we've, we've already defeated these things. So let's be careful to not go back to it. So maybe that will help people to be a little bit more bold. If, if we want to win these arguments, we've got to be prepared to show up. Um, yeah, you have to show up. The future goes to those who show up. I mean, you said previously you weren't courageous and I, I slightly take issue with you. I, I think you are actually <laughs> very courageous. You're certainly inspirational. And I, I noticed you've Thank been you. doing this tour of America. And I, I think what you're doing is incredibly important. I think it galvanizes people. And more than just galvanizing people, I think you show young Americans how to do this. Don't get angry. Don't, get, don't be lacking in civility. Don't be extreme. Don't let your frustrations boil over, but calmly, rationally, and optimistically and pleasantly make the points that you're making because I think you're incredibly persuasive. I think a young person who is trying to work out how the world works, who hears from you will be won over to conservatism in a way that perhaps some advocates for conservatism might be a little bit shrill and off-putting. I, I think you're an inspiration. You show you. us how we can win these arguments. And I, I know you've been going around America. And one thing I've really enjoyed is seeing how incredibly welcoming ordinary Americans are. You, 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 you turn up in a city, you send out a few tweets, and whoa, within, within half an hour, you've got 30 or 40 <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's been amazing. The love has been fantastic. Um, I haven't been out here since 2019. So it's interesting to see in the real world. I've, I've seen the numbers go up on social media and online. But it's really interesting to see just how many more people know of me now, um, how I can be in a city I've never been to before. And it's like, oh, wow, OK, more people are recognizing me or just want to come up and shake my hand or take a picture. Or, you know, they're telling me, oh, I learned about you from my parents or I learned about you from my kids. And I'm just like, wow, that's that's amazing. So as long as people are taking something positive and inspirational from it, then I'm happy. Well, keep going. And, you know, I mean, if you can help Americans renew their faith in America. You'll be doing not just the Republic, a world of good, you'll, you'll be, it's, it'll be great for the world because I'm, I'm convinced that the United States is, you know, it's not perfect, but I think it is the greatest country in the world, not just militarily and economically, but, but morally. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is an extraordinary place to be. And, you know, I, I wake up every morning here thinking it's a privilege to be here. And it's, it's wonderful to know that um, you appreciate America um, that way too. So keep up the Thank good you. work. Thank you for taking part in this. And um, yeah, I hope to hear from you again soon. Nice one, Douglas. Thank you. Thanks, Libby. Thanks.